Well, uh, thanks everybody for staying. And I'm going to thank you ahead of time for staying awake right after lunch. I know it's hard. So um, I, I taught, I had a couple of uh, topics I wanted to just kind of bring up to the group. It's a small group, so we can get into some discussion. So I'll try to respect time. I, I call this MVP plug use in AVMs, but it's really an opening to a different discussion um, about uh, about basically management of steel and AVMs from, from with all the tools that we have. These are disclosures, which I don't think are really relevant to, um, to this, especially since, well, Medtronic, fr frankly, Medtronic is the company that makes the plug. So I have to throw that out there, but I'm also, there's no question I'm discussing something that's off label. Um, so when we start, this is a, this is a, a patient of mine who I'm still kind of caring for. She, when she was, when she was two, she started having myoclonic movements that no one ever scanned her for and everyone ever had an idea. And then when she was 16, she had a fall, um, and she was diagnosed with it with a inoperable AVM. Um, and she came back into our clinic around 2007. We kind of had the same opinion. She hadn't had any episodes. Um, and then over a period of about 2000 to 2007 to, to last summer, um, she had progressive right side of hemiparesis. She developed an aphasia. She's very well supported by her family, but lives in assisted living facility. Between June of 2018 and April of 2019, she had five separate hemorrhages that were all intraventricular. Um, you know, one could argue some kind of in the, in the posterior aspect of the AVM, uh, but typically around uh, intraventricular. She never developed hydrocephalus. She was able to get through each one, go back to her living facility. Um, there was a suggestion of a distal Royal aneurysm, and we'll get into that later. Um, but we really got to the point where we're, you know, I'm dealing now with a large AVM that is because it's changing somehow. Why does she keep developing the hemorrhages? Why is she, and she's continuing to progress. Um, so in in the context here, we're talking about large. Uh, I hesitate every time I use a special Martin grade because we know that's a surgical grade. That's not a treatment grade, but that's our language. Um, we typically would still call the two to two and a half percent bleeding risk. Internal aneurysms are a concern. We saw one here, um, but the cognitive and neurological changes also, um, and also her progression, you start kind of coming up with the topic of steel. Steel, as we know, is, is related to the size of the AVM, the peripheral drainage of the AVM. There's a big, we talked about veins yesterday. And so there's a big, there's a real correlation with the, the venous drainage and how many larger or smaller peripheral veins are draining the AVM and how much steel we might see. Um, so, um, so in this lady, we had, we had multiple hemorrhages. We had a progressive steel and we really had to kind of say, what are we gonna do now? We've been watching you for so long. Um, so there was a lot of discussion with her family, obviously with her aphasia, she was very interactive, but couldn't express as much. Um, but we came up with basically the, the goal we had was to, um, give it, you know, if, if there was a way to address any kind of steel or high flow of the AVM had taken. And again, flow is another topic of, of the last couple of days, um, and potentially treat that choroidal aneurysm with a goal of keeping her in assisted living facility, making sure that she didn't get to the point where she was going to have to go to a nursing home. Um, the discussion that we had was decreasing the flow through the fistula to kind of limit the progression of these deficits, which had really, really ramped up over the past year. Um, but also, as we talked about yesterday with the cerebellar lesions, I, I found with cerebellar lesions, taking down portions of the cerebellar lesions, we understand a lot more what's going on. And frequently it changes a lot how the lesion behaves. So, um, so again, I'll, I'll, I've mentioned this a bit, uh, but, but really going into um, decreasing the flow and this progression was kind of the goal of the patient. This was actually her in 2006, the kind of upper portion of it. And this is kind of the upper portion in 2012. So this is an area that I just kind of chose where you can see differences in just the encephalomalacia around the AVM, okay? So a lot of the discussions that we've had about the AVM so far have been, you know, the steel and the collaterals around. I typically tend to believe that this is the AVM and this is basically the sump from the AVM, right? Where everything's coming into the AVM, but those aren't AVM vessels. And if we're targeting those, we're not, you know, we're not doing anything for the AVM. We're, we may be doing something for the steel. Um, so in going into her procedure, the plan was to kind of take down some of the fissionless components of the AVM. Um, in hopes that I could get a better idea, was this truly a, a choroidal aneurysm or, um, or, or, or at least minimize that progression? So one a couple of, you know, obviously 
access is much, much better from the standpoint, go forward. Okay, so access is much, much better for our, from our standpoint in terms of getting larger devices uh, into the AVM. Um, and I've had a few, um, a few now four AVMs where I've kind of been working from a seal standpoint to kind of decrease the fishless components. And as we all know, you know, you, you, even the glues that we are the onyx that I typically use, once you put it in a large fishless, it's just gonna fly through the system. It really doesn't stop as well. So quills become an issue from an artifact standpoint and following the lesion. So I was trying to figure out what's a better way to quickly bring down the avium from a fishless standpoint. Um, and these uh, microvascular plugs, which are really more of a peripheral plug, um, I don't know how many have seen them, but uh, I've been using them for vessel sacrifice. Uh, and so I said, what, what if we started using these for AVMs? Um, Distal access catheters really got me well into the AVM. This is kind of a pre and a post, and I've got some other images to show there. Um, but over three different sessions, and we'll go into that, um, I was able to take down the AVM, the fishless components of the AVM, a lot of the flow with less than 2,500 milligrams. So you're really taking a CAT6 catheter out there, an 027 catheter into the larger vessel, take it down. Um, and then, and, and we'll get into some of the concepts there. Um, but this is a first uh, DSA. This is what this is kind of where we were at the beginning, and this is where we were uh, towards the end. That's the first. I'm sorry. That's just the first look at the um, lesion itself. This is these are control images. This is getting the catheter into the various more officials components of the AVM, and what you start to see um, by after placing the MVPs, they don't typically just shut the AVM down. They they will they'll slow flow down and they'll thrombose behind it. So it's a little bit slower process of taking that down. You start to see the kind of stasis that we would see with some of the flow diverters. So if you can see, I can't zoom in on that, but this is kind of the front and the back of the plug. That's the front and the back of another plug. And you're starting to see that, that stasis and the contrast there. Um, so, but you can pretty much go, this is after four of the plugs where we've gone from this to that. And we've gone from this, you know, down to that. So we're starting to see a little bit of a difference um, in the AVM. And then after the third one, if we go all the way from our initial study here, we're starting to see a difference in the flow. And that's that's a typo. There weren't seven in there, there were five in there. Um, but during this time over about a four month period of time, we had a, I had a lady that went from uh, her hemiparesis where she was using a device to get around in an AFO to the point where she lost her, she did, she stopped using her device and she was actually able to stay home in her assisted living facility and walk. So she can now walk without a device. She's not using her arm. Her aphasia, I didn't have much hope for that getting much better. It had been going on for so long, but she definitely reversed some of her deficit and got to the point where she was, um, I, I think just taking the flow down made a difference. Um, we have, I have, I still have to get it. I have functional MRIs that I need to compare because I'd like to see how that changed as well. Um, but we, we really went from, uh, we, and then we got to the point where I actually saw the, I was able to see the choroidal aneurysm. So this is the aneurysm off the distal anterior choroidal and we were able to get into that and we glued that. And I think that was the reason for her bleed. I don't think the bleed was the, um, had anything to do with the steel. But I thought we got to our goal here um, in, a, in a kind of a low radiation way. Um, and then interestingly, what she got to was, was a very significant decrease in the AVM peripherally, but a lot of lenticular striates going out into this um, and feeding the rest of her AVM. And this is where I get a little controversial, but if we got to a point where all she has is lenticular striates, which are feeding the AVM, would you ever think about flow diverting that MCA? Right, because now she doesn't have any, she doesn't, how much is she using lenticular strikes if they're all going to AVM? And half the reason when we put flotiverters in there, we're getting rid of, you know, it's, it's, it, flow, it flows needed, flows needed, right? But I, I didn't do that. It just it crossed, it actually crossed a couple of our minds because that's pretty much all she had left at the end of her, um, at the end of the embolization was a lot of lenticular strike feeding. There's your choroidal aneurysm. Um, so I've had, I've had, again, four separate cases, four separate AVMs where we've been able to see patients who have progressive steel, and I've watched them over about 10 years to the point where they become less functional and we've gotten to that point. Is it, is it, is it worth considering treating steel with some of our embolization 
um, techniques. I think the, the way to do that is really decreasing flow through the fish to limit progression. Um, you know, we can definitely see those high risk lesions. See intranatal injuries was that we wouldn't be able to see because of all the fishless components. Um, and I think it's really, um, I think it's really a little more straightforward now with the devices that we have for stroke. The the MVPs are helpful. Uh, they, I think the cost on the MVP in the U.S. is somewhere about one fifteen hundred to two thousand. So as opposed to how much radiation she got versus the number of coils it would take to take down those fistulae, I think it's probably cost effective. Um, where, where I haven't gotten into yet is really looking at taking those patients using NOVA or ANOVA as the uh, statistic, statistician would say, um, and, and really quantifying how much we took that flow down by going through. I think that would be kind of our next step. I talked in a, in a, in a prior meeting in Zurich, we talked about using some of the arterial spin labeling methods to also look at quantifying the flow going through the AVM. So quantifying how much we're taking down, I think would be uh, kind of a, a next step for me. Um, you know, this is, this is where she was in 14. This is where she was in 19. Um, so she's been pretty stable. Interestingly, you can see the flow voids a lot more on the T2, but on the contrast images, the contrast is a lot more, it's not as dense on the, on the newer images as it was on the older ones. So, um, and I really began to convince myself that it was actually resectable, but again, um, not, not with her age and with her deficits. So, um, this is kind of, this is a little bit about these plugs and how, I, how I've been using them. Um, I've not had any issues with bleeding. I've not had any issues with deploying the plugs. They all go pretty well. We just have to be careful knowing that it just doesn't shut it down right away. It does take, in effect, the patients, you know, the patient will clot them off slowly, but we'll see the effect every time. Um, and you have to kind of anticipate here because the larger ones for a larger vessel, typically we're not going to see that in an AVM. But these come into play every time, and that's an 027 catheter that you have to get out there. So, um, but, but typically with a CAT6 in the MCA, we can go three different times, and it's actually pretty quick. So, um, for, I've, I've had one patient that we actually, that I, it, I guess the, 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 the counter argument to this would be in patients who you're embolizing for surgery, right, or you're embolizing to take down blood flow. Um, I did this, uh, I've, I've used a couple inpatients who went to surgery and that was helpful because it did decrease the amount of glue I'm putting in an EVM. And as, when we're, when we're operating on the EVMs with glue, it tends to be hard and it tends to be a little hard to, I'm sorry, onyx to get around. And so if I know if I'm very strategic about how much nitus I'll get into versus just taking down blood flow problems, uh, I'll use the plugs for that. And basically you can see the plug, you can cut right in front of the plug and you're done. That, that really decreases the amount of time that we're in. So I've used it for that. Um, uh, and then again, I, for, for vessel sacrifices and things for aneurysms, I use it as well. So there's the there's benefits, um, but also the, I think the disadvantage is you're really not getting the unitis penetration. So you have to kind of think about that, even though you're clotting it, it's not getting into the unitis. So, um, so I think, you know, that's a, we could talk all day about steel. We've had some radiosurgical aspects of steel that we're working with in addition to just the embolization that we can do. But I think the plugs are helpful. Uh, and I think in this lady and another, another of the, the two ladies that I've treated, I've watched over time, we've really seen a, a stop in their progressive, not some reversal. Um, so I will finish there and see if anybody has any comments on that. So thank you. You got uh... <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Babu. This is a very nice uh, concept idea. Have you tried it or maybe considered to, do, to combine it also for AVMs that you would like to cure, like uh, so have the plug, or otherwise maybe a balloon or whatever, or coils. You just put a plug a little bit proximal and then have a second catheter and then uh, do a nidus injection, especially for those so, things that are fistulous or that are high flow, as you are concerned about yeah? having uh, the vein to a uh, fast uh, filled with your onyx or squid or what's, whatsoever you, I've you used think it's it, feasible? It, yeah, it's so coiled behind it because initially I was a little concerned it would just fly, right? If you put it out, just like we were with coils. But interestingly, uh, they wedge pretty good. So once you, if you if you plan the size, and that's why that five to seven comes into play. If you use a five to seven plug and then coil behind it, that actually works pretty well. And you can you can do the larger coils through. If you can get an O two seven catheter out there, you can coil 
pretty effectively in a larger fishless vessel and it takes down the number of poles you're going to use. So I have done, I have used it for that. Um, so, you know, I, I have Onyx behind for a, um, for a SAT, but really I don't think that was that cost effective, right? You know, because the plug takes it down so well, the coils really just, in my mind, make me feel better about it potentially dislodging. Um, and so I, I, I have used Onyx. I wouldn't do that again. I would just coil behind it. It's cheaper um, and it's just as effective. So. Did, did you listen to Jacques' uh, talk yesterday? Because he mentioned that he had some aviums that he didn't understand the anatomy, like this, a lot of vessels. And, and he just pushed glue just to, to slow out, slow down some direct fistulas. And then in one case, he got a wonderful result three years later. Well, so the, yeah, that's why I mentioned the Sarah about the, and I told when he because he asked everybody he said would you be surprised and I wanted to say no because this there's something about and I don't know I, I commented on this yesterday something about the cerebellar drainage and, and that really really kind of reek of, of veins you see around the cerebellar avians that you don't see as much on the super tutorial ones I don't know I don't know what that is and I don't know why I've seen in different instances pretty good embolization that just progresses to gone right they're not gone when I'm done and I'm I've done all I can do but then we sit we either sat back and uh watched or we or one person there was a small nice that we radiated um but but what what does the that that peripheral venous drainage have to do and the one he showed was exactly like the three that I've seen just go after good embolization so I I don't know the answer to that if you have anything that so this, this look Hope, hopeless from from the beginning but yeah. uh, now it looks better and probably in a year or two if you can do a follow-up probably it will be something I, I, it really and I, I didn't get you all the con even the contrast pictures it's really gone down to very little so david had david had one i think yeah it's the smallest part in diameter you can put the, the five in. So, 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 you can uh you can get as low as i mean It'll it'll open up. I'm just going to show you that image again. But so, yeah. So you can these these two need to go. This is 021027. So it'll go. It'll open in that 1.5 to three. Yeah. And then, but I've typically because I'm leaning more towards the fistulous ones. I typically oversize. You, the trick is if you undersize it, it's going to fly because it's basically an umbrella. Right. So you want it, but if you if you oversize it too much, then it won't open as well in the vessel. But that's why they give you that range. That three to five range is usually where I've used most of them. I haven't ever really needed to go as low as that, except for I think there was a a, a pike a pike going to a big ABM in the post year process that I went maybe at one point five to three. So what do you pay for that? So again, depending on the size, but it's somewhere between fifteen and two. So if each coil is a thousand, right? For us, coils are between seven and a thousand, so seven hundred and a thousand. So that takes care of, that's all I need really. I've gotten to the point where I, it's, it's on a, it's, it's on a uh, wire and you basically just unscrew it, right? So if you think it's gonna fly, you can tell. And early on, I had to worry about it flying, but I got, point, I got to the point where I, I can wedge it pretty good. I'm not worried about flying into the AVM. So, and it's, it is, it's quick. So radiographically, it's not, and that's what you have to get used to. Radiographically, you're gonna see it kind of pull behind, pull behind, pull behind, but give it 10 minutes and it's, Gone. So, yeah. So. Maybe I, 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 missed, I misunderstood, but in, in your conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, one of your conclusions was when you don't want to uh, wear light this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, I don't know why I did that. So, let's. Sorry. You, you did yeah. I did it on intended. purpose, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> on purpose. Yeah. Okay, so the treatment where nidus penetration is not desired. When do you have this situation? So that was... As, so, because we want always that... Uh, our problem is when the, the, the thing, the onyx or the glue doesn't penetrate in the nidus. But it's exactly what we want is that goes in... Denied yeah, you want that because you're not operating on it, right? If I'm the surgeon and I'm operating on it, it it's it. I I think the it gets very hard and in a in a lesion where it's kind of superficial, but then you have to go deep. It's hard, It's not compressible, especially if you're using onyx. 
And so yeah, we are I'm, using onyx. Yeah, so if you're using onyx, it's not very compressible. And if you've taken the vessel and you're not, and, and you can go to that plug and amputate that and decrease that flow by just by putting a clip on it, then to me, that's preferable than having to try to press uh, so down the So this is pre-surgical. For, for pre-surgery. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, And right. the other thing is, do you think it's really steel? Does it exist the steel in the AVM or does it exist the hyperpressure from venous system? Because the steel is something that uh, we don't understand very well. I, I agree. I, I, that's why I start with that picture of, you know, kind of the MCA region pulling everything across the ACA circulation. And this, this lady is a perfect example. If you, I mean, their examination, her examination was, was aphasia in a left-sided hemisphere AVM, right? Fit. Arm was her next thing. So her hand was weak, okay? What, what really made her incapable of almost taking care of herself was her leg went, right? Why is, you know, why is, if, if we're going from the AVM, we're going, you know, aphasia to hand to leg, that's a good argument for now I'm pulling things, across, I'm pulling things across that, that watershed area and, I'm losing my leg ultimately because the AVM is dumping and dumping and dumping through that low flow state. So I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot we don't know about steel, but when you, when you really follow the exam and watch these patients dwindle and all the patients I've treated have been, you know, I've been watching them for upwards of 10 to 11 years, right. Until we get to the point where we can't, there's, there's something we should do, but I'm still trying to figure out exactly what we should do and how, but I, I so short answer. Yeah, I believe steel, but with our, our theme of venous management. I don't think we can avoid a venous component to this and the, and the pressure in the veins, right? But remember, an AVM is a low flow state, right? It's a low flow, low pressure state. So that's why I lean more towards the stealing part, right? So. Okay. Thank you, Babu. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's, for me, it's totally uh, contraindication. Because this is the same at the same of the presurgical uh, clipping before with a facial AVM, a proximal clipping or ligature. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this you know, don't stop the, 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 the pathology is the nidus or the shunt. Mm -hmm. You only open the more anastomosis. And, and in, your, in your presentation, you are sometimes it's good before surgery, it's incredible, it's impossible to operate this AVM after you put this proximal, no. Mm. I think it's, it's pro, maybe it's good to, to, to uh, control high flow fistula, but in general is a proximal occlusion. And this in the future is more dangerous because the AVM growth with around the collateral circulation. This device with another device. Sure, sure. Does an AVM really grow? Right? I, I don't, I, I think they change, but they don't grow. Right? Yeah. yeah. I deploy this. Yeah. Are you going to surgery after now? Yeah. If, sure. Yeah. I, I just said I did. Yeah. So, be, because you, what well, we're, well, it's, no, no. you know, did if, you operate this? Did I operate this? Yes. No, but remember, no, that no, was no. not the plan. Right, and I, you know, but but there are there are like I said, there are some that I have operated on going this way. Right now, did I onyx part and then plug other parts? Yeah, okay, because I want to take down flow within within the nidus, right? But but it's again, you what y'all from a surgery standpoint, I'm thinking about the pain I'm going through in the OR, trying to you know compress this thing, get around it, you know, pull on the healthy brain because I can't pull this rigid mass. Right, onyx is onyx is more rigid than glue, right? Than NBCA, yeah. And so, and and but so in my mind, I have to think about it that way because I'm. That's why I like playing with the whole thing, right? Because I'm I'm helping myself. Or when I talk to my colleagues in radiology, they know. Look, this part we need, this part we don't. This is what we're gonna have to take down. But yeah, I, and I I just could not find my video to show you intraoperatively what this looks like when you're in there. But we've you know you, you clip it, it's gone. You know where it is. Because you can go right to where this metal plug is, which is sitting right in the vessel. Clip, we're done. So, um, so it's it's like I said, I, I brought that up on purpose because I know it's interesting. But how big were the vessels? So that's a five to seven plug, 
right? So they're usually at a five to seven, I'll put a six. I've never had to go seven to nine, right? Um, too big for a scepter, no. Um, but you mean scepter and then onyx it? Or, yeah, so yeah. again, the, the, we've done this event before, scepter with using other balloons. It just, again, your arrest flow with that for a choir too. Right. And that's just onyx that you saw there. Yeah, yeah, for me, I, I guess I was thinking more about the, from a radiation standpoint, because this literally is boom, 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 and I'm done. I did three sessions in this lady for 2,500 milligrams. Right, as opposed to you know sitting on the pedal and going onyx and uh, yeah, that's that's another option, no question about it. Yeah. So Michael, again, in the environment that we live, again, God forbid you have a complication with this. Yeah. This is uh, totally off label, and you're using a tool, uh, so that that's my only. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's what what would be interesting is using this in a reverse <laughs> way mm -hmm. with all this exercise that you see, from, for example, when it does for. Uh, uh, reverse pressure cooker on the venous side. Mm -hmm. We have a plug that is big enough. Yeah. So you, you can just put that behind that and use the plug to hold your embolic material. So I've actually punctured one and, yeah. and embolized beyond it. Yeah. Ricardo, so, you are yeah. neurosurgeon also, no? Yeah. You are neurosurgeon. Uh, also, so, also, no, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, no. You, are, you are this ABM. What is the difference when you put one device in the, in the safe vessel on your ligature, this the carotid? Or you 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 are comfortable to, to go into the your room and with the uh, surgical room? No, I, I understand what. Ah. No, what's crazy? No, no, I, I disagree, Luis. I think what he's doing is he's creating a fictitious component. No, no, that's not Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You just yeah. you just leave the surgery to us, okay? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and Luis, uh, for this we have data. Sappy has showed this beautifully. You can measure the flow with this book. Enormous ABM. I know, but you can measure the flow on that bank and you see reduction on the flow on the bank. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's data. It's not blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not it's data. Sure. Go. Remove this ABM after But it's to say yes to him. Otherwise, no, no. he will keep on. Uh, uh, actually, I. <laughs> Actually, I, I think it's uh, reasonable that uh, use this kind of drug, in, especially in the pediatric uh, patients. Uh, normally, they have uh, uh, AVF, so use this one is very use. It's yeah. very useful. Yeah, especially maybe again, only one drug is enough. With because otherwise, kids, uh, yeah. the fistula, uh, when the artery close to the fistula, is getting larger and larger. So Normally, you have to use balloon assist coiling mm. to treat this one, and sometimes it's very, very uh, difficult. So use this one is much easier, I think. Mm. Yeah, I, I saw uh, Professor uh, Giuseppe Lanzino in Mayo Clinic. He he, he used used this one. Yeah. No, he, he, yeah. he said he didn't because we're, yeah. we're actually pulling these. We're going to pull some patients <laughs> together. <laughs> So, but now it's uh, it's it's useful because I'm not I'm just I'm just having fun. I'm not original. So. Yeah, if there's some very fast flow fistula, yeah, it's it's good. <laughs> well, thank you for the invite, Luis. Muchas gracias. Thank you.